I'd first just like to thank both my private teacher, Logan Skelton, and my wife, Lindsay, for all of their help in preparing for this. Tonight, I'll be pleased to present a, uh, I'll be pleased to be presenting a lecture based on the four Chopin ballades, followed by a performance of this brilliant set of works. This lecture will be comprised of three main topics, narrative, structure, and the presence of the waltz. I'd like to begin by describing the ballad as a genre. What is a ballad? It is a form of verse, a narrative often set to music. It is derived from the French chanson balladé, originally used as dancing songs. After all, balladé means to dance. There are many different traditions with ballads, and many of the individual characteristics stem from the regions from which they were written. However, in all forms, they are narrative in nature, possessing a self-contained story that uses imagery to describe epic tales that are tragic, romantic, historical, and comical. Narrative storytelling techniques include flashback, foreshadowing, and tone. All of these can be seen in the Chopin ballades and help to move the narrative process along. Why would Chopin call these masterpieces ballades, since they're not based on a specific text or literary work? A few things that immediately come to mind. The, the idea of narrative, of reciting an epic tale. In writing ballads, Chopin was part of a larger movement in the 19th century to unite literary genres with music. He was attracted to this title because his pieces were grand. Pastoral and rural life were prevalent themes in literature, and we can certainly see these in ballads number two and number four. Ballads in literature have a set meter that stresses certain syllables. Similarly, Chopin's ballads contain waltzes that stress certain beats and give the music a distinctive dance-like character. Ballads in, liter in literature are narrative by nature. They are self-contained as stories. Another common feature of ballads is repetition, often repeating certain lines or stanzas. We can certainly see a heavy amount of repetition in the themes that Chopin presents. Finally, narrative poetry uses the voices of a narrator as well as other characters. In the ballads, the introductions could be likened to the voice of a narrator, which brings us to the opening of the first ballad. First Blood opens with an ambiguous and improvisatory introduction, as if a storyteller is setting up an epic tale. It is unique because it's self-contained before transitioning into the primary theme that contains the waltz-like figure, found in measure eight. The open octaves lead us to think that it is a single person telling the story. In this respect, the introduction is very much like recitative found in opera. To heighten the drama, the introduction starts in the key of A flat major. <laughs> Which is strange for a key in G minor, and through a series of chromatic movement, it confuses the listener as to what key the piece is actually in. The introduction ends with a very ambiguous chord, a G minor chord, with a suspended E flat that causes harmonic tension, a tone that foreshadows the second key theme of E flat. Similarly, in the fourth ballad, we see a self-contained introduction, a sweet and lyrical C major theme that is followed by a meandering waltz in F minor. settle into the waltz. This introduction, like the first ballad, seems unrelated to all other material in the piece, aside from a brief quotation of this material later in the work. I'll just show you that. That's in A major. Okay. It 
is different from the first balad in that it is pastoral by nature. It is also different because it does not have a single narrator, but contains multiple moving voices. The second balad begins with material that seems to emerge from the distance. A pastoral setting with an almost inaudible flute song being played. It is as if one is walking through the countryside and has to strain his or her ears to hear the distant melody be play being played in some far off village. Only as one walks closer can one behold the beautiful theme that Chopin presents. The key of F major, just one other side note, is typical of a pastoral setting. The third ballad is characterized by its lilting waltz-like figurations. However, the opening is more organic and improvisatory before settling into the main rhythmic motives of the piece. like figurations, lilting. Thus, the first eight bars contain material that highly contrasts with the main waltz-like character of the piece. I want to move on now to codas and their narrative role. Each of the four ballads ends with an epic coda that provides an unquestionably final and firm conclusion. Ballads one, two, and four have stormy and tragic codas. The third ballad's coda ends in a jubilant celebration. The coda of the third ballad recalls a sweet and innocent A-flat major theme originally heard in measure 116. This theme originally presented an, an alarming shift from the key of F major to the key of A-flat major, a direct and immediate move to an unexpected key. Coda, he uses this material to drive home the key of A-flat major, even marking Piumoso. The theme's role has been transformed. Originally a fleeting and lighthearted idea, it is now joyous and life-affirming. Perhaps the most volatile of all Chopin ballades is ballad number two, a work that ends with a relentless coda, but with a special twist. After furiously rising through a series of intensifying chords, Chopin reaches the height of passion, followed by a moment of just static holding of that chord. <laughs> Week to continue. Oh, sorry. Uh, what he does next is a complete surprise. He marks tempo one and he brings back the original pastoral material, but now in the key of A minor. Almost too weak to continue. He rests before the final three chords. It is as if the piece is succumbing to its dejected fate. The coda of the fourth ballad is a fitting conclusion to the set of the four ballads, presenting the performer with the most difficult of technical demands among all of the ballads. This coda is enhanced greatly by the preceding material, a furious collection of chords followed by a deafening silence. Next 
Complete tranquility comes with long sustained chords in the key of C major, the same key as the introduction. As if recalling This harmonic choice enhances the narrative of the piece, as though the hero of the story is pausing for a moment of reflection, a nostalgic minute to remember the happiest times of his life before plunging into the greatest battle he's ever experienced. <laughs> In the coda, Chopin challenges the performer with a variety of technical demands, including double thirds. Ah, yeah, see, it's a challenge. Awkwardly placed intervals. And finally, polymeter and metric displacement. So in the left hand, we have this. One, two, three, four. And in the right hand, we have. Chopin regains momentum twice before finally reaching the tragic final chords of the piece. Perhaps the most dramatic coda of all is the coda of the first ballad. The narrative quality becomes especially prevalent at the end of the coda. After enormous ascending and descending scalar passages, Chopin settles on a low G, making a first time listener question if the piece is actually over. <laughs> this low G with a vigorous ascending scale, only to cut the tone immediately, rest, then plunge into dark, soft G minor chords. This is sort of like a piano version of a recitative and orchestra interplay. What he does next is if you recall the introduction, takes that, but he twists it around in an accelerando, a sextuplet, and he cuts it again with the rest and repeats that same material, now in tenths, so it's even more passionate. Same ritenuto. Where will he go from here? He stretches the hands to extremely wide registers and proceeds to create harsh dissonances by stepping in one towards another. He heightens the ugliness and excitement by inserting grace notes for the first two bars of this, marked triple forte. He also ups the ante by marking poco ritenuto followed by accelerando to the last two bars before finally capping the piece with two victorious G minor chords, the last being open octave Gs. to be particularly fascinating because think about how the piece began. All open octaves, and how does he end it? With open octaves. I'd like to shift now to structure, and I'd like to start with a simple yet profound quote from James Paracolis from Ballades Without Words. Chopin's ballad structure seems to require three musical events, statement of themes, transformation of themes, and resolution. Many theorists have tried to mold the ballades into a particular form. The ballades, in fact, do not conform to any specific traditional form, although they certainly possess elements of traditional musical forms. Ballad number one, is it written in sonata style? There are elements of sonata style present in the ballad. Two strikingly different themes, a quasi-development, followed by a quasi-recapitulation of the main theme in the original key. 
However, this ballad can't be in sonata form for a variety of reasons. First, the development is too tonally stable, uh, highly emphasizing the key of E flat, which we saw in theme two. In traditional sonata form, development sections modulate through a variety of different keys. Also, the primary and secondary themes are recapitulated in reverse order, and though it's not unheard of to have that happen, it certainly is not typical in sonata form. Also, the key relationship between the first and second theme is peculiar. The, the key starts after that crazy ambiguous introduction in the key of G minor with the waltz. And if we're looking to norms, traditional features, we would think it would go to B flat major, but instead he goes to E flat major. Typically, Oh, finally, the recapitulation isn't a true return to the home key, as the primary theme is placed over a dominant pedal before catapulting into the coda, so we don't get a true satisfaction of a returning to the home key. Thus, it is more beneficial to look at it through the lens that Paracolis describes, three-part musical form. This ties back to the idea of narrative. The three statements of the primary theme, each appearing after the piece has lost all momentum, announce the start of three different musical stages as we'll see on this next slide. So here's the end of the introduction. With that beautiful E flat, which foreshadows so many things. Next, we see stage two being initiated. over a dominant pedal and finally stage three the same thing another dominant pedal now I want to present something that we will call the structural accidental and I think this is probably the most fascinating part of the presentation um, as I was researching this, this just really caught my attention. There are many harmonic shifts in Chopin's music or use of unexpected notes throughout his compositions that may seem surprising or random. However, many of these play an important role in foreshadowing future events. Whenever you hear a strange harmonic shift in Chopin's music, remember it. What seems like a fleeting accidental or harmonic shift may become an entirely new key area. Let's look at a few examples. The first is this strange chord that we've already pointed out during the narrative section. That's at the end of the introduction, right before the coda. We get that same tense chord, and finally at the end of the coda. Chopin not only uses this in the most calm parts of the piece, but he foreshadows and it transforms into the height of fashion. Another example of a structural uh, accidental is seen in the use of the Neapolitan in the introduction. So remember, if you're in G minor, the Neapolitan would be the key of A flat. Again, it seems strange. Um, it's certainly not the way you would expect a piece in G minor to start. But we don't really see it stressed again until the arrival of the gypsy-like coda. The offbeat A flat major chords in an environment that is so heavily G minor not only creates rhythmic tension, but also creates harmonic tension that calls the Neapolitan back from the introduction. Another example of the structural exam accidental is seen in the unexpected move to A major in bar 32. Here we're clearly in G minor. Then he makes this very unexpected shift. And then a few bars later, 
shifts back to G minor. It's just fleeting, just a moment. What is this foreshadowing? Not until, uh, not until we reach the climax of stage two do we find out. A major. This fleeting little thing now becomes one of the hardiest climaxes of the entire work. small detail that I wanted to point out. Think back to the introduction, how it ends. Seems like a strange little figuration that may not play a big role, but then in the height of the coda, Chopin's, uh, again, reverses those roles. Moving on to Ballade number three. Like Ballade number one, this piece contains three stages, with the last stage also being the coda, according to Paracolis. Let's observe how Chopin moves through each of these stages. Stage one, this is self-contained. The opening phrase is introduction-like, as we saw before, until moving to the lilting waltz-like figure. After this, Drama heightens, followed by a recapitulation of the original opening material, and finally, a cadence in A-flat major. So here we have the opening. This is how the final section, or the, the ending of the intro, um, stage one ends. So it could be its own little work, but in stage two, he alternates between the secondary theme presented in many different keys, as well as the tertiary theme. So here's the second theme. Little transition. Here it is. And here's the tertiary theme. And remember this one. This one's going to be important. Finally, he ends stage two by melting together the primary theme and the secondary theme. So here we have secondary theme. And then first theme in sotto voce. I think that's quite significant. Stage three takes that same main theme. It turns it into a celebration. Moving on to blad number two. Of all the blads, blad number two is the moodiest, transitioning abruptly from an innocent pastoral to a stormy and violent contrasting theme. sectional. There are only brief moments of storminess in the calm sections and only small points of relief in the, storming, in the stormy sections. 
It is peculiar that of all the ballads, ballad number two is the only one that does not end in the same key as it was written, uh, in which it was written. It's in F major to begin with, now it ends in A minor. As uh, I mentioned in the narrative section of this presentation, the F major theme is transformed. Once calm and peaceful is now depressing. This could point to an overall message of a loss of innocence. Let us move on to the final ballade. Below is a, or up here is a chart um, that gives bar numbers for each of the sections of the fourth ballad according to Jim Sampson. Now, I don't expect you to memorize all that that quickly, but just uh, notice C major, F minor, G flat major, B flat, A flat, A major, D flat major. F minor is the key of the main theme, the main waltz-like figuration. And each time Chopin brings these back in a variation, he always brings back the key of F minor. So the first one, I want to just go through these. He presents four different variations of this main theme. The first one is quite simple, just a little melodic elaboration, as you can see at the end of that first line. Rather than just that, he goes to that. The next example, the second variation that he presents, uses contrapuntal techniques, and this is my favorite one. Really brilliant counterpoint. The next uses canon and imitation. ending he announces so again brilliant contrapuntal techniques here uh, including canon finally the last one recitative or melisma sounds very operatic in nature Chopin ties the piece together with that chordal passage that I played a little earlier, but now I want to point a couple things out. On the left is all of the keys that I had just mentioned, and although he doesn't use every single one of them, he does use quite a few of them in this passage. So D flat major, G flat, C, F, B, and then again, moving back. Major. It really does just take all of the key areas of the piece and kind of tie them up before launching us into the coda. Finally, I want to talk about the presence of the waltz in the ballads and um, kind of a half-remembered quality that they have to them. Of all the um, all of the ballads are written in compound meter. The second, third, and fourth ballads are in six-eight time, with the first being in six-four time. Although all of the Chopin waltzes are written in 3-4 time, with the exception of one written in 3-8, the compound meter that is present in the ballad still evokes an undeniable waltz-like quality. I just want to present two sh examples of Chopin uh, waltzes. the lilting rhythm, the smooth flowing lines, and the straightforward presentation of the melodies. Now, moving on to the ballads, what is this idea of half-remembered? 
what, what is this idea of a half-remembered waltz? In the Ballades, there are many instances of a waltz being presented only to disintegrate into nothing. These waltz-like phrases are searching, questioning, inquisitive, as if Chopin's trying to recall something and gives up just after he begins. Then there's another wave of inspiration, of hope, of excitement, followed by another letdown of emotion. This ebb and flow of hope and despair leads one to feel as if Chopin is grasping at the idea of a waltz, one that isn't fully formed, one that isn't quite mature. It's almost as if he's saying, remember this waltz? And then he gets through a small portion and then says, oh yes, and then it goes like this, oh and then this. His style of writing gives us the notion that he's conjuring something out of the deep recesses of his memory. For this reason, his waltzes seem half-remembered and are not nearly as plain and straightforward as the waltzes I just presented. Let's look at the opening waltz of the first ballad. It's as if he's saying, remember this? And then he kind of forgets, and then, okay, let's, let's throw this main motive in. Then a little weaker, searching. excitement leading kind of to this meandering this same type of meandering half remembered waltz is present in the primary theme of the F minor ballad as well so he says it goes something like this just repeats it. And then as if he's conjuring it out of his mind, oh, he shifts to A flat. Gains a little more confidence. Only to disintegrate. examples of waltzes abound in the ballads. While each does not necessarily fit the exact description of half-remembered, there are several waltzes that seem to emerge out of the past, as if they're being brought into the present from some far-off place. I want to look at these two examples. The first one from ballad number three, after this beautiful section one ends. After the big passage work coda in G minor. Calls us out of the distance, out of a deep memory. There's one last type of waltz that I want to present before playing each of these ballads for you, and it's the idea of this forward-pressing, vigorous waltz. This is seen in the first ballad. The stormiest example of all is this waltz that seems maniacal, possessed, uh, almost drunk. It's a waltz gone mad. <laughs> remembered waltzes, I'd like to present to each of you the four Chopin ballades. <laughs> 